Hi, everybody. This is Gino Vanelli. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the persons appearing on the program. He is an award-winning filmmaker, director, producer, and author. Today on Rainbow Country, Steve Balderson joins me to talk about his memoir, Year of the Horror. That and more in episode 378, so stay tuned. The Gay Talk Radio right here on Rainbow Country. Hi, this is Emily Saliers from Indigo Girls. Hey everyone, this is Chris Harder, porn star, burlesque performer, and the creator of Porn to be a Star. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Well, hello and welcome to a brand new journey through Rainbow Country. As I like to call it, a little gay radio show working to give voice to the LGBT community and beyond. And as always... I am your tour guide through Rainbow Country. I'm producer and host, Mark Tara. By the way, Rainbow Country originates from CIUT-FM in Toronto, and now proudly in syndication on 12 outlets across Canada, from coast to coast to coast. The Yukon, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the east coast of Canada in Newfoundland, Ontario, even down in Buffalo, New York, and online. Well, thanks to you tuning in, streaming, downloading, but ultimately listening. Together, we continue to build Rainbow Country into a nationally syndicated gay radio show, a number one LGBT podcast on Podomatic.com's Gay and Lesbian Chart, as well as being recognized as Canada's number one LGBT podcast on Feedspot.com. So today award-winning filmmaker, director, producer, and author, Steve Balderson, joins me to talk about his memoir, Year of the Whore, working with legendary actress Karen Black, and more. We'll find out all about those things, plus we'll hear some exclusive excerpts from the audiobook read by the author himself, Steve Balderson. Plus an hour two, music from LGBT artists, independent artists, voices that we've come to know and love in classic disco, classic 80s, classic house. And on this episode, I'm featuring some Canadian disco, some queer alternative, and more. All that lies ahead as we start Journey 378 through Rainbow Country. And our first stop is the Rainbow Country School for Canadian Gay History. On today's lesson from activist, author, and historian, Tim McCaskill, Canada's LGBT community of the 1980s. If we think of the 1970s as the period where the gay community was trying to get noticed, the 1980s was the time when we actually got noticed and started getting seriously slammed. The cops had never been happy with Trudeau's 1969 decriminalization. If you look at historian Tom Hooper's work, you'll see that arrests of gay men actually increased across the country after decriminalization. Remember, this was way before apps. If you wanted to hook up, baths or bars were the best places to go, so those were the places that police targeted. And There were a series of baths and bar raids in Montreal and Toronto and Edmonton and Ottawa and other cities. The Toronto bath raids of February 5th, 1981, are the most famous. When Toronto's pro-gay mayor, John Sewell, and the first openly gay candidate for city council, George Hislop, were both defeated in the municipal elections in 1980, the cops figured we were vulnerable and swooped. They smashed into most of the city's gay baths, trashed the places, and arrested almost 300 men on a range of charges. It wasn't just the baths, they were also hassling the bars on concocted liquor license violations, and they were busting individuals and bookstores for porn. Basically, they were trying to shut down the gay village and recriminalize homosexuality. But that night when they hit the baths, they bit off more than they could chew. 
In Toronto, for the first time, the activists and the small business people and the normally non-political bar and bath patrons all came together in a series of massive demonstrations. We raised money to fight the charges in court and won. We made common cause with uh, black and South Asian communities who are also experiencing police brutality and harassment, and we demanded community control of the police. We called for changes to the criminal code to get rid of antiquated laws that still criminalize sex. That new community unity also laid the foundation for dealing with the next crisis that was about to affect us all, the AIDS epidemic. This is Tim McCaskill, a gay liberation dinosaur from another planet and author of Queer Progress. Hi, I'm Saida Garrett, co-writer of Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mr. Mark Tara. Up next, Year of the Whore. Chapter 1. Grazie mille. Arriving in Venice is done by speedboat, as mysterious and thrilling as a Bond film, and we rocketed across the lagoon between Venezia and the airport, eventually nearing the celebrated constellation of islands. Our boat slowed as we entered the famous canals, narrowing at every turn, that slid us deeper into the ancient labyrinth and mystery that is Venice. Ornate palazzos and decorative buildings lined the canals towering over us. As the sun set and a fog settled in, the purple of night was fast descending. The three of us were delirious from transatlantic travel. After a brief dinner, we returned to our rooms and collapsed into sleep. I woke the next morning to the sounds of church bells. There seemed to be thousands of them, echoing from every direction. I opened the enormous windows and leaned out into the air, so crisp and fresh. The bells marked the start of the hour and had no intention of stopping any time soon. I grabbed my phone to record their sounds and use them in a soundtrack for a future movie I'll direct. It was a cacophony of exquisite chimes and tones. My partner of twelve years, who I'll call Bernie, was an emotionally abusive sociopath, and I don't use those terms lightly. We were life partners as well as business partners. We weren't married, thank God, because same-sex marriage wasn't yet legal. My brother coined the name Bernie, because, like Bernie Madoff, who stole from tens of thousands of people with his infamous Ponzi scheme, my partner Bernie, I discovered too late, stole money from me and my family. Lots of it. This theft was profoundly unethical, the very definition of stealth. But alas, not against the law. I could do nothing except flee, and I did. After Bernie's betrayal, I felt utterly broken, psychologically, spiritually, physically. Any dreams of intimacy or sexuality had long since passed and were now dormant, more like six feet under. While healing and grieving, my mother gave me the best advice. She told me quite seriously, we come from a long line of warriors, cut off our feet, and we'll learn how to walk. As a child, my mother protected herself by hiding in a locked bathroom when my abusive alcoholic grandfather came after her with a butcher's knife. She grew up a warrior and raised me to be a warrior. Steve Balderson, hi, how are you? I'm great, how are you? I am well. Am I saying your last name correctly, Balderson? Yes, correct. Okay, good. Yay, one for me. (laughs) 
<laughs> I have to say thank you for being here to have your voice, your story be heard by the by the LGBT community and beyond. So thank you for that, especially to talk about your your memoir, your story, essentially your sexually charged, passionate story, your memoir. Yeah. Year, year of the whore. Let's mm-hmm. start. W- let's start with the basics. Year of well, the whore. This is your. This is your. <laughs> your. Your memoir. Your story. Talk to me about some of the topics that you're talking about within these pages. Well, it began when I was out of a terrible. Uh, relationship with someone who had betrayed me and I was emotionally broken and in the process of healing and uh, learning about myself, I was about to turn 40. So I sent myself to Venice, Italy for a month with two friends and it, we went in the off season. It was in January. So it was ve- actually really affordable to go then. And while I was there, I had a set of experiences that reignited it was it was in addition to a sexual reawakening a spiritual one so all of these switches turned on and i write about this experience in the first chapter and that's what kicks off the year of the whore because i returned to the u.s and then a series of inexplicable situations happened to me in the middle of kansas which is where i was living at the time that were bananas and when i just I was telling the story to a friend of mine who's a publisher, and, and she convinced me over the course of a couple of years to uh, write it down. And I didn't ever think of that there was such a thing as an erotic memoir. Um, mm. But I guess there is. <laughs> and so now that's what it is. Okay, so... I'm excited for the world to be able to read this memoir. It's like nothing you've ever read. You'll be amazed at what takes place in the 119 pages of this book. Those are some strong words, some big words, some powerful words. Can you give me one example, one example of something that you're talking about within Year of the Whore that will uh, amaze people? Uh that this is in this book, or maybe even surprise people. Can you give me one example? An amuse-bouche, s'il Well, play. I mean, there was, okay, in this town that I live in, in Kansas, Wamigo, Kansas, it's a town of about 4,000 people. And there's a college town nearby. So it's, you know, not quite a suburb, but it's, it's near a college town. And, but I was sitting at my desk in my house, minding my own business, and the doorbell rang and I, nobody rings the doorbell. Nobody comes over. I don't, you know, who was it? So I, I go downstairs and it is a, a magazine salesman whom, you know, this was 2015. So people still did have magazines. I gave up magazines, you know, and went on online, you know, after uh, 2016, 17. But at the time people still had magazines and he was peddling magazines. And it was like, it was this uh, Latin gymnast is sort of how I would describe him. And he kept trying to sell me these magazines. I wasn't interested in the magazines. I was just, you know. Were you interested in him? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Totally. But I, I couldn't get a reading on the situation. So I didn't I didn't pursue anything until he said, you know, I said, I don't need any magazines. And and he said, please, I just need to sell twenty dollars more and then I'll win. And he described that he and his friends had this contest and I don't know what was and i said well i don't need any magazines i'm sorry and he said well what about a massage (laughs) and i said Uh i said okay wait i mean like i said okay i get them every two weeks from a really good massage therapist i don't need a crappy one are you any good and he said oh no you know i've never had any um complaints and i uh, give my friends back rubs all the time or something to that bullshit. And I said, all right, I don't need a bad one. There's nothing worse than having a bad massage. But if you come inside and make out with me, I'll give you 20 bucks. (laughs) So, (laughs) so he did. And it was crazy. And then I gave him $20 and he left. And I was just like, I can't believe I just, that just happened. So I go back to my office and I decide I'm just going to quit working today. And I closed up the computers. I went downstairs I get a text from somebody who 
is currently working at the New York Times in in New York, saying that uh, you know he was home visiting and and could he stop by? And I was completely unaware at the time of hookup culture. I didn't know about it really. I mean, I knew it happened, but I wasn't aware of the lingo. I wasn't sort of t- t- tapped into. I didn't see any of the signs <laughs> in this communication. So I'm thinking, oh, I'll put some cheese and crackers out. He'll come over, we'll have a glass of wine, and I'll visit with him about what it's like to live in the Big Apple, you know? And he walks in the door, and within about, I don't know, 10 minutes, we were just on the kitchen island. And it was, it was, <laughs> I mean, it was, and so after the, that experience, I was like, wait a minute, it was just a few hours ago with the magazine salesman. Like, what is this mm. day today, you know? And after dinner, I'm watching TV, and the doorbell rings and I go to the doorbell and it's a pizza delivery boy <laughs> and he's come to the wrong address. <laughs> and at this point I'm so tired and so delirious from the day that I say, I'm really sorry. That's across the street over there at the house with the lights on, not here, <laughs> you know? And I say, I'm, I'm really sorry, but you're really cute. And he said, Oh, you are too. And I said, what time did you get off work? And he said, 10 30. And then I said, but then he said, oh, I can't come tonight. I'll have to come by tomorrow. And I said, all right, that's fine. So the next morning when I woke up and I realized that all of that happened in one day and I didn't even leave my house, the inexplicable uh, situation, I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible. So I, I go to the calendar and I flip the page to February and I'm, I'm starting to look at holidays that are coming up. And I noticed that Chinese New Year is coming. And I say, oh, my God, it's going to be the year of the whore. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what started this all. Because indeed wow. it was. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Fas- so that's fas- just fas- fascinating. That that day must live in your brain. <laughs> it would, totally. It's seared. And it's also chapter two <laughs> of the book. <laughs> so, so you say that there have been many sexual awakening books, but very few with gay protagonists, gay lead characters, essentially. Why do you think that is? Um, Well, I understand that in the LGBTQ community, there's a lot of struggle. And I understand that there, there is, and, you know, uh, anger and violence and drug abuse and all these things are part of every community. But in, in my existence, my growing up and being a part of the gay community, I didn't know those things. So when I set out to, you know, write this and share, it's my story and it's, it's different than a lot of other people's stories. Um, I was encouraged just to be myself from a young age. So I never, was in or out of the, I mean, I was, there was no closet in my world at all. Um, and so I can relate. I've, I've known people, I've met people who've struggled. In fact, I've helped some people, but I, I don't know what that's like to live it. Um, and I don't know whether the mainstream media is, is beginning to, um, open and branch and welcome all kinds of stories in, in especially for our community. Um, that they didn't 15, 20 years ago and, or that they have, but so, so it's such a small way. I think that now, you know, even mainstream movies are beginning to show it more. In Year of the Whore, you write about conscious sex. What is conscious sex? Can you yes. talk to me about that? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I define conscious sex as being really present, really in the moment. In chapter one, when I had the, this lover in Venice, Italy, who sort of taught me how to be a lover, one of the, uh, lessons was to explore and think about the five senses, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, taste, and smell one at a time. So when, you're in the the visual elements and you're really concentrating on everything you see 
and the shadows and the way they move against the skin or um, the way the hairs turn around the body or, or the smoothness of the skin. And then you begin to really think about what you're hearing, you know, the other person's breathing or their heartbeat or moans or words or, and not just right here with each other, but also out in the world, you know, uh, the rain outside the window or the, or the wind or the birds or whatever's happening nearby. And, and the feeling, the kinesthetic feeling of really being aware of what is happening and what you're experiencing uh, brings you into such a present moment that you're totally conscious and aware. You know, it's like this giant awareness. And when I had that experience sexually, I was like, boom, what is this? You know, and because I think that in all the other times, you know, that I'd had sex in my life, I, I would imagine it being unconscious. Like I wasn't really there i was thinking about you know the climax or i was thinking about will we get caught or well i was thinking about you know like what's happening what are we having for dinner you know like i wasn't really present with any of the lovers i'd had uh until that moment and so part of the year of the whore was me really exciting or excited to uh, practice <laughs> this conscious sex as many times as possible and to share it with people and uh I think there are other names for it too. I went to a um, Davy Wavy put on a gay tantric sex retreat in Hawaii that I was hired to document. And um, while there, I was listening to a lot of the lessons and some of them were very, very similar, but the language used was different. So um, uh, people might call it uh, tantra. People might call it conscious sex. People might call it all sorts of things. But for me, it's, it's just about being present and with your partner of whether it's a lover that you're having for two hours or if it's the lover that you've had for 20 years, you know, it's just really listening and being with each other um, that I think is pretty magical. And, and it's just so, I don't know, I, ever since then, I just, it's a, it's a fun thing to practice for sure. Biggest turn on. Short, muscly, gymnast wrestlers that are around <laughs> five, five. <laughs> Five five. Mm -hmm. Oh I'm, wow! I'm about six five, so I oh. like the the short, muscly ones. You can kind of pick up and throw around, or like <laughs> okay. over your shoulder. Or, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, biggest turn off then. Uh, um, unconscious sex. You mm. know, someone who shows up drunk or completely whacked out of their mind on something. I'm just like that's so not appealing to me. And the story behind the title "Year of the Whore" is it we're you were saying you pulled down the calendar and you were looking and you saw, Yes, is that where the, the title came from? Yes. I was like, I had to have been born in the secret Zodiac sign of the whore, but <laughs> as a total joke internally, but my mm -hmm. friend, she was like, Oh, that's an incredible title. And I'm like, okay, I guess. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> at first I didn't know for sure, but then it's she, after a while, you know, she convinced me it was really difficult at first to be as vulnerable as I am in this book and admit some of these things. But then I figured, who cares? You know, just maybe it'll help somebody. Maybe it'll turn somebody on. Maybe it'll, you know, I don't know what it'll do. But it, uh, you know, yes, that's where the year of the whore came from was just the the impetus. And and in fact, the book ends the following January into February. So it's literally this 12 month period. And on that note, we'll return after this Rainbow Country update. Hi, this is Michael Anthony Alago, music executive, photographer, author, and you are listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. As you may know, Rainbow Country started broadcasting on air June 7th, 2016. And as of today, this little gay radio show is now heard on 12 outlets across Canada from coast to coast to coast. 
Plus, on the podcast website, Podomatic.com, Rainbow Country is a number one LGBT podcast. And on the online aggregating website, Feedspot.com, Rainbow Country is Canada's number one LGBT podcast. This show airs on independent radio, campus and community radio, as well as on streaming. What do all of these outlets have in common? Well, they're all listener-supported. To help keep the lights on, the streams up, and the airwaves broadcasting. So if you think episodes like The State of Trans Healthcare in Canada, Operation Soap, an inside look at the February 5th, 1981 bathhouse raids in Toronto, if you think episodes like those, not to mention giving airplay to queer recording artists from around the world, If you, like me, think it's important to have a show, to have a platform like Rainbow Country, giving voice to the LGBT community, and beyond. I hope you'll consider making a donation to this very outlet you are tuned to. And if you're listening to the edited podcast version, please consider making a donation to an outlet that does carry Rainbow Country. Simply go to marktara.com and hit the syndication banner to find a list of syndicated outlets. Rainbow Country, a little gay radio show working to give voice to the LGBT community and beyond. A heartfelt thank you for having your voice and your support be heard. Hi, my name is Joanne Vanicola, and I'm an actor and a writer, and I was first on Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on discussing the massacre at Pulse Club in, in Orlando. Um, I realized how important it was for our community to have a radio station uh, specifically for our issues to, to talk about people in, in the LGBTQ community and to provide a, an outlet for our stories, um, to discuss uh, our politics, culture, and give voice to the to the issues that matter to us, and of course our artists and and um, the things that we do globally, and and talk about culture. And without people like Mark Tara uh, providing a space for this with with a radio show like this, then uh, we wouldn't have that voice. So support, tune in. Thank you. I'm Billy Newton Davis, and we're sitting here on Rainbow Country with the fabulous Mark Tara. So, Steve, you are you are an author. You've penned, I believe, five five books. You're an award winning filmmaker. How did you get into filmmaking originally? I went to CalArts for film school, and when I was around 21, I made my first film, and it went to Cannes in France, and was licensed and distributed all over the globe, and I didn't know how rare that was, because I was living in Kansas, and I didn't know anything about it. So I raised you know another set of dollars, and had another story, and made that film, uh, which sort of starred uh, Karen Black and also the rock star Mike Patton from Faith No More and Mr. Bungle. And that film went on to win numerous awards and be distributed globally and ended up on Roger Ebert's list of the best films that year. And I continued to do that for about 20 years before I realized how how rare that was. And it's just something I've always done. I I would say that visual storytelling is my home where I feel most comfortable. When I'm writing a story, if I can make the pictures of it in my mind really, really vivid, then then writing is uh, not totally effortless, but it's, it's close to my real language. Um, but I can't really do much else <laughs> in the world except make a sandwich um, and, have, and have conscious sex. 
Um, <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you, you were just mentioning it, your first film, I believe, uh, 1998's uh, Pep Squad. You yes. were just saying premiered at, at Cannes. 2005, Firecracker, starring Karen Black from Airport 1975. Totally. Love that film. If people haven't seen those airport movies from the 70s, they're amazing. They're so check, good. Check check it out. When it comes to your, your creating a movie and writing a script and coming up with characters, your 2005 movie starred Karen Black. Or do you think of specific actors when you're coming up with a character, when you're writing a script, or... Do you just write it, create the characters, and then you you place the the actors within that? Talk to me about your process. When I'm in the middle of writing it, I envision somebody, whether they're living or dead. Just I, I need to have that visual in my mind so that I can sort of anticipate what that person might do next if they were the character. Other times, you know, and then when I get to the casting process, you know, I I might end up casting someone who is nothing like the, the character that I had created in my head. Um, but that, you know, I've seen something or they've done something and brought something to the character that I was like, Oh my God, that's amazing. That's exactly what we want. Um, and I hadn't thought of it before. And I mean, that's the beauty of working with really good actors is that they will show you and bring you something that you would have never thought of. Um, and so it's, it's both, I've had people in mind, you know, uh, my friend Susan Trailer is a brilliant actress and we sat down to create a story together for a character that she would play. So we knew all along it was going to be her. And so that kind of informed, you know, what would happen in the scenes. Um, but uh, when I, when I wrote the, uh, it's, it's just now been re-released. It's called uh, Sex, Lies and Sugar. And Kevin Richardson from the Backstreet Boys makes his acting debut in it. And when I had written his part, I didn't yet know him. So I, I didn't envision him until after I was introduced to him. We started talking specifically about him being in that film. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's a mix all across the, the, the way, but once I've cast someone, I work with them really, really well, you know, getting into the mind of the character. Um, that film, Sex, Lies and Sugar is on 2B. And if you haven't seen it, Kevin is dynamite as an actor. Um, I know he was in Chicago on Broadway, um, but I don't think maybe he's done one other movie since mine. I, I'm not exactly sure, but he's a terrific actor, like beyond stellar. I just love okay. working with uh, good actors. So, so, so you're talking about Kevin Kevin Richardson from the Backstreet Boys. Wasn't that movie originally called Casserole Roll? Casserole and Club. Casserole Club, and it's in the U.S. Library of Congress. Yes. So, hello. No, I know. When when they called me and asked me, I was like, "Is this a joke?" And and I, but no, I had to <laughs> I had to send them, you know, the master copy. Mm. And when I asked my friend Pleasant Gaiman, I asked her, uh, "Why do they do that?" And she had had something also in the Library of Congress permanent collection, and she said, "If it's of historical significance or artistic value," and I thought, "Oh, instantly." Uh, because it's a period piece set in 1969 and it is period accurate, um, that might be, or it might just be the people we had in it. I, I don't know why it is, but it's, it's a, it was a, a credible honor for sure. Well done to that. So we're talking about filmmaking, we're talking about actors, we're talking about acting. Uh, who's been, who should tell whose story? That's, uh, been a hot topic for the last few years. Who should be telling whose story? Uh, a few years ago, Halle Berry uh, got some backlash when word came out that she may be considering playing a trans character. Uh, Eddie Redmayne played the trans character in the 2015 film The Danish Girl. And in 2021, he said that playing that character was a mistake you are a professional. You're in in the the film industry. You're part of the LGBT community. What's your take 
I know it's a big question, but what's your take on who should be telling whose story? And when does when do we get back to just acting? What's your take? Both. I, I understand that there probably should be a period of time where we welcome and embrace gay people and trans people playing gay and trans parts, you know? Um, and then I think it also needs to be taken into consideration that it should always be the best person for the part. Now, then that, that's how I consider it for acting. Now, if I, because it's about acting, it's not about being, it's not a documentary. Now, the p- telling the story part, I think that if I were, I feel less comfortable telling a heterosexual story because I don't know anything about that. I can imagine it, I can witness it, I can observe it, but it's not as close to me. It's not my story. So when I'm, you know, going to make a movie with, gay love or a gay s- story i know exactly what that is and i think that if somebody's going to tell a trans story the p- the person making it the person telling it should be trans because that's the where you get the truthful honesty and the 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 core truth of what this story is i think if we you know imagine and sure there's there are people who can be creative and and imagine what it's like to be a, uh, you know, cartoon, you know, but, mm-hmm. you know, I think that the story should be told by those who it, the story's about. Quote, Steve Balderson's brilliant, unquote, Roger Ebert. When you saw that, that quote from Roger Ebert, what went through your mind? Well, You're I talking wept. about this earlier you wept yeah i wept i i was i landed in chicago and when i got off the plane because i was headed to the premiere of that movie that night and i got a call saying there's basically a love letter that's an entire page from roger ebert in the chicago sun times about this movie today and i was like what so i grabbed a copy and i'm in the taxi to my airport or my hotel and i just start weeping And I looked around and I'm like, it's one of those moments, you know, where you're like, I remember exactly how it felt sitting in that taxi. I was holding the Chicago Sun-Times. I could smell the newspaper. I was looking around me and I was weeping and I was like, wow, okay, this, this is a thing right now. And, you know, I'll never forget it. Did you ever feel like uh, maybe that, was there ever a moment, whether it's this one or another one, where you sort of felt like, you know, hey, I, I've, I've arrived. I've, I'm doing this. People are, are recognizing me or seeing me. Was it maybe this moment or another moment? I think there are a few, there are lots of them. And I think that for each part of each part of the process or each movie, it's been a little different. So in that moment, that was certainly one of them that said, okay, you're, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing you're on the right track. Just keep mm-hmm. going, you know, just like really wish welcome this, you know, take mm-hmm. this and welcome it. Like little signposts along the way that, that are validating I'm on the right track. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And who knows where the track ends up, but <laughs> if, you know, if, if you keep getting the signs. Horville. And, totally. That's exactly where we're headed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Gus Van Sant, Lee Daniels, uh, John Waters, Steve Balderson. All of you have one thing in common. Do you know what that is? We're gay. Another thing you all have in common. Do you know what that is? Um, Are we all Capricorns? I don't know about that, but you're all on IMDb's top 100 gay and lesbian directors working today. How does that make you feel being on that list? Pretty great. In that company. I love it. I, I love it because it's, I've always thought of myself as a filmmaker who happens to be gay as opposed to being a gay filmmaker. But when I saw that, I thought, no, be proud that you're a gay filmmaker, you know? And like, I love that. It's, it's to be, and especially with those guys, like those other people, the people on that list are some of my favorites. 
When did you begin to recognize that you were, you had same sex attraction, that uh, you were attracted to other other men? When did that start crystallizing for you? I was just talking about this the other day with this friend of mine. And I think it was in the 1980s, I had to have been around eight, nine or 10. And there would be like those um, workout commercials Mm -hmm. you know it's like um the before the bow flex you know there was like solo flex and like these commercials would come on and be like okay yeah that's that's for me (laughs) you know like and i i remember that fluttering you know i didn't know what it was but i remember the Mm -hmm. fluttering feeling for sure you grew up in kansas in the small town in kansas yeah what wamigo uh uh wamigo wamigo what was it like for you a little gay kid growing up in small town Kansas. Well, I was a little bit in my own bubble, like my he- own head, but it was terrible. I mean, I had a couple of good friends and I, uh, you know, didn't start exploring. I was a late bloomer, so I didn't start exploring that part of my life until about my senior year of high school. Um, but I mean, no, but it, would, it was so funny because there was this kid on the wrestling team who was dating this girl and he and I would hook up like, you know, three times a week at whatever. And then we'd never talk about it, but we would, we would just be sort of, you know, friends or whatever. Um, but as far as like, I do, I was never really bullied. Um, I've always been really, really tall. So I think that might be part of why I, I wasn't, um, I was made fun of a lot for being in an upper middle class family more than I was for being any sort of having any difference. Mm. Love Ven- Venzia? Venezia. Love Venezia. Is this going to be a project of yours, an upcoming film? Yes, this is the one a project that I'm directing. Um, and it's based on chapter one of The Year of the Whore. But when I when I went through and decided to make a movie about this particular story, which is all centered around conscious sex, I I first decided to fictionalize it do an adaptation, keep the story about what happened in my story, but tell it in a way, you know, give them character names, you know, fictionalize them if you need to make it more cinematic. Uh, so it's, a, it's not a, you know, autobiography version of, of film, but um, it, yeah, it's just, a, it's a pure gay love story and without any conflict you know, if, if there is any conflict, it's a little bit of an internal conflict in Act One, but otherwise it's just a pure, beautiful story about love and kindness and compassion and conscious sex. And I can't and wait is, to do it. And is this film going to have like mainstream actors and adult film actors as well? Yeah, we're we're blending up the the group. I mean, I've <clears throat> seen really, really good, strong movies that have explicit things in them done by professional actors. And I've also seen um, adult actors who actually are really, really good actors who've never been given a chance to, you know, be in a non-adult situation acting. And I think that's cool. You know, I think I I don't know so much about the adult entertainment industry, but I do know that there's this sort of like, um, Bruce LaBruce is a director and also a friend of mine. And he's talked to me about how sometimes the porn world uh, thinks he's taking advantage of them. And yet then the mainstream world thinks he's too pornographic or, you know, not mainstream enough. There's both sides, you know, seem to just want to not coexist. And I think there's nothing wrong with coexisting. Um, People have done it. And I think more people should. And I think over the course of time, You know, I mean, what are we talking? Five, 10, 15 years, it'll be a completely different story than it is today. And in a hundred years, for sure, if we are around on earth that long, um, I think there will be significant change that everybody was just sort of like blended Mm. all in one, all at once. I'm interested to know, have you heard or do you know of a Canadian film called Short Bus? Mm Mm-hmm. So yes. that that film is a Canadian film and it features like on-screen sex. Yeah. Will exactly. You, will you be following that same sort of will you be having 
on-screen sex as well in this upcoming film, potentially? It's, well, it's all simulated, mm, but okay. there, there will be all sorts of things shown. Okay. <laughs> if, uh, I mean, we're, we're not, I, we haven't filmed it yet, so I'll, I'll need, you know, I, what specifically, um, you know, but I've got my laundry list of things to check to film. Um, but no, I, Peter Stickles is a friend of mine who was in short bus and I directed him in my film called watch out. Uh, and I remember watching that thinking at the time, uh, and, and there are others since then. There was a, a film from San Francisco called, uh, I want your love. I don't know if you know about it, but it's beautiful and it's such a good story. And it just pushes that line, you know, and, um, you know, I, I, my thinking is essentially that, you know, I'm saying this as a metaphor and hyperbole, everything in the Louvre was at one time considered pornography, right? Or, you know, statues that had to be, you know, chiseled and, you know, whatever. So I feel like what's the state of sexuality in art and it's the human condition. And when are we going to let go of such judgment around it? You know, and it, it's already started happening, but I feel like, you know, in a hundred years, you know, I mean, I remember watching television as a kid and you couldn't have half of what's allowed now on TV, you know? And I think that as a culture, we're evolving to enough that I don't think it'll be a question at some point. I don't know when that'll be, but at some point. <sighs> So Steve, here's my here's my last question for you. Uh, when it comes to your when it comes to your art, whether it's whether it's one of your films, whether it's one of your books like Year of the Whore, uh, that's also available in in audiobook. What do you hope audiences come away with once they've experienced a Steve Balderson project? What do you hope audiences take away from your from your art, essentially? Um. I, I hope, well, I think each one is, has a different intention, but if it's, if it's something where I had intended to inspire someone, um, I hope they feel inspired. Uh, if it's something, you know, that's very dark or disturbing, I, I hope maybe it, it causes them to think, you know, to stop and think about that for a little bit, you know, explore behavior, their own behavior or the world's behavior. Um, I think they're all different, but as long as it's, it's taken in somehow, um, you know, even if somebody hates it and they, you know, viscerally hate it, I, I love that too. You know, it's, it's to have a reaction, you know, whether it's, oh, my, you know, absolute love and, and appreciation or absolute hatred or just the worst thing in the world is that someone reads or listens or watches something and then has zero reaction. You know, they're just like, hmm, <laughs> that's like the worst. <laughs> so as long as there's something. Yeah, I hear ya. I hear ya. Steve Balderson, thank you so much for your time. Well said, well done, well filmed, well written. Thank you, thank you. I love the show. Thanks for having me. For my 40th birthday, I knew I needed to celebrate my new freedom, my life, my future. Hell, I needed time to even imagine a future. I planned a vacation to Venice for the entire month of January. My friends Jennifer and Aaron joined me. I scored an off-season discounted rate at an exquisite four-star hotel near Piazza San Marco. The hotel was just steps away from the magnificent Basilica de San Marco, with its domes and golden mosaic interior, and Palazzo Ducal, the Doge's Palace, a masterpiece of medieval architecture that looks like a cake a deliciously gothic 20th century cake. I opened a gay social hookup app to find out who might be both gay and nearby. I'm a big fan of the apps because they allow people to basically be screened before ever meeting in person. I usually message a guy who appears interesting in one way or another, and if he wants to meet up, I'll agree to meeting him in public for a coffee. If the guy is unwilling to meet in public, I delete the conversation. Guys who refuse to meet in public are either married, not out, not actually the person in the photos, a serial killer stalking prey, or possibly a bigoted homophobic gang wanting to harm gay people. 
I love that the app totally abolishes the need to go to a bar in order to meet someone. Sure, it's a bit like ordering food from a delivery menu, or looking through headshots before deciding who to audition, but it saves a lot of valuable time. Sexually, I'm a total top. Imagine spending all night with someone, learning you have amazing chemistry in every way, until it comes down to it, and you learn he's also a total top. The app lets you sidestep a lot of the bullshit no one enjoys about the dating process. I came across a profile for a man named Antonio, and after a discussion, we decided to meet for a coffee. Jennifer and Aaron sat nearby as backup, in case Antonio turned out to be a nightmare. In the distance, I saw him hurrying down the tiny street. Antonio, a northern, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Italian, wore clothing made of the finest fabric, a gray cashmere scarf and a dark wool overcoat. Through all the layers of clothing, he seemed strong and well-proportioned. He looked like a university professor straight out of central casting. I learned he was working on his dissertation in art history and taught calligraphy in his spare time. He was dashing, smart, polite, affectionate, and I admired his kindness. Plus, his blue eyes mesmerized me. After our coffee, I introduced him to my friends, and he offered to show us around Venice. Though I was disappointed that Antonio and I wouldn't be immediately fooling around, I was also eager to explore more than just his body. That afternoon, he showed me, Jennifer and Aaron, the Venice only locals knew. We walked a block or two off the main tourist street to a hidden gym of a bar, frequented by the locals. They served cicchetti, the Italian version of tapas. We shared spicy olives, toasts topped with speck and cheese, and sipped delightfully dry white wine. The next day, Antonio took me to lunch at a hidden spot, and when we entered, he spoke familiarly with the hostess. We were ushered into the back room where a different menu was served for workmen on their lunch hour. I devoured the experience incredibly inexpensive and excellent wine, some of the best pasta I've ever had in my life, and sitting next to me was a guy I couldn't believe was actually real. We flirted, and under the table I leaned my leg against his. His affection and kindness radiated in all directions. I wanted him to kiss me, yet he didn't. After two weeks of Antonio joining me and my friends for Prosecco and Cicchetti, I was becoming a bit restless. Antonio and I hadn't even made out yet. I'm from Kansas, so I don't know the customary dating or hookup etiquette involving gay Venetian guys, but I had assumed it would be more provocative or racy, more unabashed and immediate somehow. Finally, I decided to confront him. Antonio, I said, we aren't dating. I don't live here. I'm going to leave Italy and return to the U.S. soon. If we're going to fool around, we need to get this show on the road. He turned to me and leaned in close. I could feel his breath on my face, smell his soap, and feel the warmth from his body. I think you're ready, he whispered. I immediately saw the Italian machismo cliché, and in my mind I rolled my eyes. But, it turns out, desire is a treasure, and there was nothing cliché about Antonio. I'd been hungry to kiss him, to taste him, for weeks. Sitting close and feeling that brush of his leg against mine added to the slow burn. Desire is, of course, something just out of reach and something not easy to grab, something seemingly unattainable. And not being able to have it made me want it even more. An eruption was inevitable. Maybe it was part of his plan to feed my longing past the point of reasonable thought. By the time we climbed the stairs to the top of the palazzo and entered his place, I had let go of all restraint. I kissed him, twisting my tongue around his. My fingers clumsily undid the top button of his shirt. I almost tore open his shirt to send the buttons flying across the room. But suddenly, Antonio pulled back, leaving me panting, hungry, and a bit confused. Wait, he said. 
Antonio paused, closed his eyes, and took several deep breaths. I waited, but he was clearly in no hurry. If anything, he was slowing down. He patted his hair down, tucking strands behind his ears. Then slowly looked up at me. He leaned closer, speaking in a soft and low voice. Now we'll have sex. But I'd like you to think about each of the five senses, one sense at a time. Focus what you see and what you hear and touch and smell and taste. Year of the Whore is available wherever you get your favorite books. Plus, it's also available as an audiobook. On Amazon.ca, it has a rating of 5 out of 5 stars. For more on this artist, simply visit stevebalderson.com. Phone rings. I got a message from the mayor. He's going to call me back the next day. I get the call, and he said, if you'd accept, uh, would you, we'd like to honor you with the key to the city. It was an event um, later that year in May. Just a key, right? Like, key to what? A decent job, uh, a good singing career. Uh, it's really a metaphor, but it's history. So a reporter wants to talk to me and says, uh, you know, well, so it's a key, right? Like, what's the big deal? I said, well, not everybody gets the key. So I looked it up, and I guess it is kind of a big deal. The date, May 17th, 2018, when trans activist Susan Gapka made history by becoming the first trans woman to be presented with the key to the city of Toronto. By the way, past recipients include Rush and the Raptors. And just like that, this little gay journey through Rainbow Country has come to an end. For the full two-hour episode, simply head over to marktara.com, where everything is connected and hit the archives banner. To keep up to date with the show, check out my socials at marktara. The podcast is available on all major platforms. And finally, I want to take this time to thank you for taking your time to be with me. Remember, we are living in days of making dreams come true. So believe in yourself, and the world will believe in you. Hi, I'm Garrett Conley, author of Boy Erased, a memoir. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Mm.